So you are in the midst of a very interesting series of lectures called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Yes. And something that struck me from the very first one is that you started this series talking about something called flow. Could you explain a little bit what, what is flow and why is it important? Sure. Uh, so flow is, uh, is a, a phenomena that was made famous by the work of Chik Mihaly's Csikszentmihalyi um, in two books, uh, the book uh, Optimal Experience and then uh, the follow-up book entitled Flow. And then he's had uh, books and articles and his students and so forth. Uh, and so what flow is, it's called optimal experience because it's optimal in two senses. Uh, people regard this as one of the best experiences they can have in their life. In fact, there seems to be important relations between how often you enter the flow state and how meaningful you find your life, right? Um, it's optimal in that sense. And also people view it as optimal in that they're, they're, they're performing at their best. They're at their most creative, right? They're doing uh, sort of the best. And their actions to observers seem the most graceful, sort of most filled with that, you know, extra something that we, 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 we regard as aesthetically uh, excellent, right? Um, you know, when, it, when you see an athlete in the flow state, there's this, ac there's this extra dimension of grace and efficacy to their action. And then from the inside, like if you're doing, like if you're sparring in a, as a martial artist or you're playing jazz, you, 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 you get this, oh, I'm in this peak place where I'm really at doing the, the, the best I can. So that, that's what it sort of feels like and you can see why uh, uh, people pursue it. In fact, uh, as, as I talk about in this series, it, it, it's, it makes sense of otherwise absurd behavior like, uh, like rock climbing, because uh, rock climbing, uh, like it, it, it's, it's like some sort of Greek mythological torture. You're told to go up a rock face, you hurt yourself, you might fall and you know, damage yourself, and then once you get to the top, you just come back down. And the reason people pursue the uh, rock climbing is, well, we, it, it's been studied, it, it tends to generate the flow state. So that's the, the state, and it, it, it's created by a, a set of very important conditions. Um, it's a state in which there is this very tight relationship between the demands on the environment. Think of the rock climber again and your skills. Your skills, you sort of have to be uh, stretching your skills, right, to meet the demands of the environment. So you have to give it everything in you. You have to be learning as you're solving your problems. You have to be developing even as you're functioning, right? And, and so that needs to be the case. There needs to be very clear feedback of information. There can't be a lot of ambiguity in this situation, like, right? Um, and then there has to be a tight coupling. What I mean by that is my actions and the response of the environment have to be tightly coupled to each other. And then finally, error has to really matter. Like, you know, it has to be, it really matters to me. It, uh, it has to, so the rock climber can fall, right? The jazz musician can suddenly screw up and, ah, uh, right? The martial artist gets hit in the face. So error has to matter. Under those conditions, uh, people will get into uh, the flow state. One other thing as an important factor, um, the cognitive side of this, the kind of training that is predictive of uh, being able to get in the flow state is some kind of mindfulness training. Great, and I want to talk about mindfulness in a moment, but I'm curious about what flow has to do. When I'm in that state and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, in flow, which I think most people have a sense of what that is, how does that relate to how I make meaning or how I experience meaning in the world? All right, so, I mean, obviously there's multiple interpretations about this. So while there's a consensus of the description, uh, there hasn't been as much work done on the cognitive processes, because that's what you're referring to when you're talking about meaning making, that are going on in this. So I recently published a, uh, a chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Spontaneous Thought with Leo Ferraro and Aria Harrow Bennett. Um, and um, we, 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 we sort of theorized as to what, and we tried to make an argument as to what we think is actually going on. Um, so to, to give a, uh, sort of a, a, the gist of it, um, many of us have had an experience of insight, uh, like you, where, and what we realize is, oh, I've been misframing this whole thing incorrectly. The reason why I can't get a solution is the way I've been framing this problem is incorrect. What happens is when you get that aha moment, uh, people like Topolinsky and Reber and others have talked about it's like a spike in fluency in your processing. That's why you get sort of that flash and things are sort of vivid and we, we often represent it with a light bulb going on over them. You get this sort of, it's both 
a flash of intelligibility you suddenly understand and it's also a phenomenological flash the world seems brighter and people actually also enjoy the insight uh, experience right it, it, it's now think about what the rock climber is doing right the rock climber is lit, it gets into situations, if it's a good rock climb, if it's challenging, if it's demanding, right, where they get blocked, they get locked, they're Im literally impassing, and they, they reframe, and they have to reframe not just how they're thinking, they have to re literally restructure their body, right, to get to the next place. And what happens is that insight will prime and make make more likely the next insight they need, which will then prime and make more likely the next insight they need. The jazz musician does, uh, you know, some innovation, and then that primes the next one that is needed, that primes the next ones that's needed. The martial artist does some new, you know, like, you know, stretches their skills and does this innovation, and then that primes. And so what you can think of the flow experience like, part of it is, it's like a cascade of insights. There's an aha moment bleeding into an aha, 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 aha. Right? And, 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 and what's different is, like normally with an insight problem, you sort of stop and you impasse. What's happening in flow is it's happening rapidly enough, you don't really impasse, you almost impasse, and then you're constantly restructuring. It's like this extended aha moment. So that's why in flow people have this tremendous sense of deep understanding, deep connection, discovery, and why it's so salient. They, they talk about everything so vivid and crystal clear, and it's, and it's so good. It's not like physical pleasure, like, you know, like the pleasure of eating chocolate. It's, it's, the, it's like the cognitive pleasure of the aha moment and insight. That's one aspect. There's another important aspect. A lot of your learning is done implicitly. There's experimental work about this. It's called implicit learning. And of course, there's always there's theoretical controversies about how quite to interpret it. But the basic idea is you pick up on lots of patterns in the environment uh, that, you, that you, you, you don't have sort of access to in working memory. You, you can't sort of introspect and become aware of those patterns that you're picking up. Uh, so for example, many of your viewers, I assume, know how far to stand away from another person. Nobody ever explicitly taught you that, right? And so what's happening in the flow state is you're really training your insight ability and you're really training your uh, intuition, intuition generating ability and you're doing this in a highly integrated, coordinated manner. And that feeds deeply into the machinery by which you are able to solve problems, make sense, sense intuitive connections in your world around you. So that's why it would contribute greatly to how meaningful you find your life. So that's very interesting and what really struck me when you were talking about those, those three aspects that get us into flow and into this kind of creative mode where it seems easier to solve problems is that they seem the opposite of what we have, for example, on social media. We can't trust our information, we have fake news. There's not really any consequence for what we say or how we behave. And so I'm, I'm just wondering what you make of that. So, I mean, uh, my co-author, um, Leo Ferraro, talks about one of the dangers of uh, social media. He has this term, he calls it confirmation porn, confirmation pornography. Because, because all of these constraints are removed, our cognition has all of these processes that are indispensable to our adaptive intelligence. But those self-organizing processes also make us deeply susceptible to, to biases. Now, if you put people into things like social media and the kinds of constraints that you have, for example, on getting good flow or the kinds of constraints you need for good reasoning or the kind of constraints you need for good discourse are removed, all of those biases can now run in an unchecked, unmonitored, unmanaged manner. So what Leo means by confirmation porn, one of the most pressing and powerful biases we have is called the confirmation bias. We tend to only look for evidence that confirms our beliefs. Now in small scale situations where people are in, you know, tightly coupled to their environment and acting, acting as checks and balances on each other, that's very effective. But if you take that confirmation bias and put it into social media, you get the echo chamber, right? And you get this confirmation porn where all people are doing is using social media in an autodidactic fashion to confirm whatever beliefs they already have. So that's what uh, I think is going on. The next thing I wanted to talk about, um, and I'll go into it with a, with a famous quote from Timothy Leary of uh, turn on, tune in, drop out. So obviously psychedelics, you know, hit the culture pretty, in a pretty significant way in the 1960s and are now going through a massive revival that you've talked about them in your films. Are psychedelics a psychotechnology? So I wouldn't, I mean, 
there's a bit, there's a, a, there's a possible equivocation here. We could be talking about the chemical thing, or we can be talking about the experience surrounding it. Uh, and, and then I would say we can create frameworks of psychotechnologies around the experience such that we can, right, structure that experience to engender the kinds of transformations that are conducive to the cultivation of wisdom. So I think, to put it in a sentence, we can create sapiential frameworks of psychotechnologies around psychedelic experiences that will afford the kind of transformation people are, are seeing. So uh, let me give you what I think is a, 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 a hopeful analogy. Many of people are aware that part of what's driving this, the psychedelic renaissance, at least academically, scientifically, is a lot of evidence about the efficacy of psychedelic experience in like alleviating treatment-resistant depression or addiction or helping people to confront existential despair, people who are in terminal situations as a palliative um, uh, means for them to get an existential mode to face uh, their imminent death. So people are aware of that. What people need to be aware of, let, let's give one really clear example. The use of psychedelics dealing with sort of like post-traumatic stress disorder or re treatment resistant depression. It's always the psychedelics in conjunction with therapy. The scientific work is always a conjunction. Simply taking the drug on its own, it will not... You see, what you're doing is you're... you're we'll talk about this. We can talk about some of the underlying neurological and cognitive processes in a minute, if you wish. But basically what you're doing is you're, you're loosening up the, the constraints on your construal of the situation, and you're altering your salience landscape. Now, that can... Right? That can be that can sort of activate processes of self-organization that lead to self-transcendence, but it can also activate processes of self-organization that lead to deep self-trans, sorry, deep self-deception. So you can massively bullshit yourself with these things too, very much like being in the echo chamber inside, you know, social media. So you need to set up the proper sapiential framework so that those processes, right, are being like the, the kind of self-organization that's being triggered is the self-transcending kind of self-organization, not the self-deceiving kind of self-organization. So the psychotechnologies that we set up around these psychedelics, which of course is what's happening in therapy, because therapy is a prototypical set of psychotechnologies for trying to change people's consciousness and cognition, you, you want to set those up. And if you look into the spiritual traditions, that's always the case. These psychedelics are not used, uh, you know, in entertainment situations or recreational situations or on a daily basis. They're used within a sacred context uh, that is really designed to frame them so to bring about the kind of sapiential transformation I was talking about. Yes. No, I've, I've experienced that firsthand. I've, I've seen as many people more confused through their psychedelic use than then less confused. Um, and it, it strikes me, you know, you talk a lot about um, the impact of ancient Greece on, on our worldview now. And of course, they had the Eleusinian Mysteries, which was kind of a, a big psychodrama that, you know, uh, that was probably as powerful as what they took, if they took anything. And I'm just wondering, aside from the therapy side of things, I mean, do you see people taking psychedelics in a way that is conducive to that? Have you seen any evidence of that? Do you think still no more needs to be done? Um, I do see evidence of that. I mean, there's lots of people that are doing it, recreational entertainment, just as sort of a cognitive booster or enhancer or something like that. Uh, but I know of, like, person to person and more of the literature. Um, I've spoken at conferences where I've talked about this and got a lot of response. Uh, so I don't have scientific evidence on this. Uh, there are some people that are trying to gather that. But I have a lot of at least suggestive anecdotal evidence that many people are trying to integrate the pursuit of, of sort of, I don't know, of rejuvenating a sense of sacredness in their life with sets of psychotechnologies wrapped around the psychedelic experiences. And do you think, are you optimistic that this current revolution in psychedelics could could help us wake up more effectively from the meaning crisis and get us into a to kind of a new mode of thinking. Yeah, I, I am more optimistic precisely because the way it's now being academically framed, it's not being framed in the Timothy Leary uh, 
countercultural thing, at least not in that sense. Uh, it's being, a lot of it's being framed therapeutically, existentially, and even, as I've said, you know, sapientially, spiritually, trying to get this together. <clears throat> the problem we face with that, and this is how the meaning crisis interacts with this, right, is we don't, we don't have established wisdom traditions and institutions in the West anymore. We've lost them. So we know, to, we know where to go for, for knowledge and information. We go to history and science for knowledge. We go to the internet for information, the media. But where do you go for wisdom? So what happens is, right, people tend to pursue this in an autodidactic manner. That they try to cobble things together. And the, 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 the danger with that is autodidactism is also a, 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 a venue in which you can really fall prey to bullshitting yourself and self-deception. I mean, a lot of famous autodidacts turned out to be really, really horrible people uh, for, for exactly that reason. So because we do not have vetted safe networks of things like sort of, I, I don't know what, like secular monasteries or something where people can go where there are traditions and it's evolving traditions, I don't mean stagnant, evolving traditions and, and communities, uh, well vetted, practiced, scientifically studied sets of psychotechnologies integrated systematically together. People don't have that. That's what, because of the meaning crisis, that means they t there is this great danger of the attempt to wed the sacredness with the, the psychedelic experience is falling prey to a lot of autodidactic, uh, um, for lack of a better word, corruption. And, and, and so um, I would hope that all of the things that I see moving towards addressing the meaning crisis, w and uh, uh, as when I was talking with David, not just theoretically, but practically, engineering communities and institutions and sets of psychotechnologies properly vetted, managed with, you know, uh, appropriate connections to the scientific world, right? But that we would be able, as we're doing this alleviation of the meaning crisis, we, that need to create the psychotechnologies will integrate with movements that are occurring because there are these movements. I'm going to be talking to a person on a podcast next week who's set up some secular monasteries. There's attempts to try and capture what the Scandinavian countries did with, you know, with the movement of creating the self-cultivation centers. Um, and so there's, there's, there's things happening. I'm hoping these two things will join so that we will get places. Um, so I, I think it's Mark Hayden who talks about the idea we should create cert cert certification programs for psychedelics like we do for any other potentially dangerous things like driving a car and you should have to there should be established institutions educational facilities places where you can go and train receive critical and informative feedback and then use the psychedelics within that context i'm hoping we can build towards that i guess one of the big questions in science versus spirituality if you want to call it that because i understand a part of your work is to kind of bridge um, and it relates actually as well to psychedelics in some way. I, I help organize a, a big conference called Breaking Convention, Psychedelics Conference. And one of the main tensions there is between people who have these peak experiences and their deep feeling is that they have tapped into a wider consciousness that is beyond them, a kind of uh, consciousness that is uh, everywhere. And then there's more materialist people who say, no, this is all just being generated in your brain. So that seems to be a big um, crux point. And I, I've heard it described as the hard and soft problem of consciousness. You know, what, what is consciousness? So it'd be interesting just to hear your thoughts on, can that be reconciled? Does it need to be for, for this kind of blending? I, 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 I mean, consciousness is really hard. Um, I, I, I'm doing, I, I am doing work on it. You know, work I'm doing with Anderson Tan and Richard Wu, and, uh, you know, and, um, what, what, I, what I want to say is, I think I would argue that one of the important things consciousness is doing, why we seem to need consciousness for ill-defined novel problems, right, challenging problems in that way, is because consciousness is doing this kind of higher order relevance realization. And part of what consciousness does is give me this perspectival knowing of a salience landscape that makes all this meaning making possible. And that's why altered states of consciousness um, it can also reveal aspects of the environment um, uh, that are not normally revealed. Like if you look at let, let, one, one quick 
um, digression. This actually goes back to the drug issue in some ways. Uh, my friend and colleague, brilliant man, Mark Lewis, says, you know, when we're talking about drug addiction, don't focus on the, on the drug, the material thing, uh, and a, like a disease model that the drug enters you. He says, instead, what you should think about is you, 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 the drug triggers a state which sort of lowers that process of co-identification. A little bit of your cognitive flexibility goes away. So the, the, the options available to you in the world narrow a bit. Now, because they narrow, that tends to like traumatize your cognition and it starts to become more rigid, it narrows. And you see what happens here? You get this cycle, this vicious feedback loop and he calls it reciprocal narrowing. And when I was talking to Mark about this, I said, well, that reciprocal narrowing could go the other way, reciprocal realization. Like in when Plato talks about this and coming out of the cave and all of that. And he said, oh yeah, you're right, that, that makes sense, right? And so I think we have to understand something, understand a way of bridging this by understanding that, that dynamic connectivity is what we are actually wanting to talk about. Here's how I would put this. We should stop thinking of these experiences as either a, a, pro, a subjective property of our cognition or an objective property of the physical world. These are transjective properties about our connectedness. And these are real relations. Notice the adjective. These are real relations that afford reciprocal narrowing, if, if we're doing it wrong, or afford reciprocal realization. And I think what's happening, because I do a lot of work on these higher states of consciousness, is people are actually wanting to describe reciprocal realization. They feel like they're getting to the depths of themselves and the depths of reality at the same time. And they are right. I agree with them that the standard grammar of subjectivity and objectivity cannot capture that transjective realization. But I'm trying to say, when we think about relevance realization, if we think about these processes and we think about the real relations, the dynamical systems, we can craft a language that will bridge between, you know, the hardline objectivists and the hardline subjectivists about this. So that's how I would respond. I think there is an important way in which we can create a new vocabulary about transjectivity, dynamical coupling, reciprocal, uh, re reciprocal realization that will be, and I try to do this in some of my talks on higher states of consciousness. I have some on YouTube on exactly this, and I'll talk about it in the video series as well, that do justice both to the phenomenology and the sense of importance and depth that people are feeling and to the scientific worldview that, you know, the, the, what you call the materialists are holding on to. I think it does justice to both. This leads quite nicely into what I wanted to talk about next, which is mindfulness. Um, because we, we actually both share, um, we both have a practice, but we also train people as well. One of the um, phrases I love in mindfulness is don't believe everything you think. And so it seems that mindfulness is, ca can very much be a tool for helping us wake up from these biases and, and maybe I guess waking up from the meaning crisis in general. So I'd love to hear, hear your thoughts on that. Right, so what I would say is mindfulness uh, does, um, but we need to reformulate how I think we're thinking about mindfulness um, and, and think of it instead of a, a single practice as an ecology of practices. And I would also say we need to integrate mindfulness with other complementary psychotechnologies uh, like Baron and Stanovich's idea of active open-mindedness. And I think getting sets of psychotechnologies that complement each other in terms of their strengths and weaknesses is, is what we should actually uh, be pursuing. Let's talk about mindfulness first, though. Um, and then if you, if you give me a chance, I'll come back and talk about active open-mindedness. Uh, so um, the thing about this, um, and, and this is work I did with Leo Ferraro, uh, published in 2016, um, the, th the thing about this is you have to be careful uh, when we're entering into this discourse because there's two different discourses we can have about mindfulness. There's the, there's the language we use in a setting in which we're training mindfulness. And I can use all kind of language in that setting that's appropriate to actually training the skill for you, right? And this is analogous that I can train your memory by doing what Sherlock does, right? The, 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 the mental palace, right? The method of loci. And, 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 and that really trains memory very well. 
The problem with the method of loci is it gives you the idea that that's how memories work, that they're located and stored as stable objects in stable location. And memory doesn't work like that at all. Like there's just, it just, that spatial metaphor for memory is just completely misleading. So the language of training is very effective, but you should not translate it uncritically into the language of explaining. Right? And so a lot of the language of uh, training that we're using, in, in, in the, at least in the West, is you know, pay attention to the present moment, focus on the here and now, right? sort of concentrate. And that's, like I said, that's the language I, I use too. Uh, but I think if we're trying to explain what mindfulness is, that's, I think, that, that's not, uh, not good enough. It's, it's got too impoverished a view of attention, and it doesn't really tell us what people are doing cognitively, because terms like here and now are irredeemably vague. What is here, this couch, this room, Toronto, what's now, this moment, this hour, this day? We've tended to think of mindfulness just as equated to being present, a state of being present that's achieved in meditation. I would argue that that's an unfair representation of the ecology of practices, for example, found within Buddhism. Because, for example, you have a whole set of psychotechnologies in the Eightfold Path. And you have things like right mindfulness and right concentration, which tells you that there are wrong mindfulness and wrong uh, concentration. And what do I mean by that? Uh, in meditation, you're doing this stepping back and looking at. You're breaking any inappropriate framings you have, right? And that can help afford insight. But you need another thing, too. To actually really optimize for insight, you need only not to break an inappropriate frame. You need, how, you need, how, you need to know how to make a new and more penetrative, deeper frame that picks up on those real patterns in reality. And that's what I would argue contemplative practices are. And the, word you're, the words yourself, the, themselves point to it. M meditation is like moving towards the center. That's why we talk about finding your center a lot in meditation. Contemplation, the word contemplation has the word temple in it. The, the t you know, temple is where you looked in the sky originally. You look deep into the depths of reality. Contemplatio is the Latin for the Greek theoria, which is where we get the word theory from, because the theoria originally means to look, try to look and see the deeper patterns in reality. And so what you have in Buddhism is you have meditative practices like Vipassana that help you break inappropriate framing, and you have contemplative practices like Metta that help you make new appropriate framing and that and having them dynamically trained together really optimizes and affords your insight and your capacities for insight we know this from uh, work done at the University of Toronto uh, by um, Colin DeYoung, uh, um, Joe Flanders and, uh, and Jordan Peterson and they sort of acknowledged it was inspired by me so um, that that capacity for insight is also directly re re related to your capacity for picking up on self-deception, right? Um, so, so it has to do with sort of uh, a particular experimental methodology, so I won't get into that. So mindfulness really enhances your insight, but one more thing before I turn to another topic. The level at which, like when, I, when I'm doing meta, right, I'm trying to pick up on, and I'm contemplating Right? I'm trying to pick up on the process of co-identification. I'm, I'm trying to become aware of something that's normally ha happening intuitively and automatically. I'm trying to become aware of the identities I'm assuming and the identities assigning. Right now, I'm a scientist and you're an interviewer. Right? And this room, which is normally my partner's living room, is, you know, it's an arena for an interview. Like, ident objects are being assigned identities, I'm a and that process of co-identification is happening all the time. And I want to bring that into my awareness by my contemplative practice. I want to see those patterns. So what I can do is I can develop this capacity for insight by doing contemplation and meditation, and then I can take it not at just a level of intellectual insight, but down to a modal level, the existential level, the levels by which we are creating these patterns of identities for ourselves and, uh, and others in the world around. And I can get insight at that level by which identities are being formed. And that is, that's what I think the Vipassana, which means insight, is in Vipassana. 
like insight at that, that level of the process of identity uh, formation. And so that's, it's not just insight into your sort of daily life, which mindfulness will give you more creative, right? Help you make better sense, reduce your self-deception, but it can also take you down to this very deep fundamental level at which we're making the relationships between agency and the arena of things so that all of our actions are meaningful to us. So I think that's what, how mindfulness can really address that. But like I say, and, though, and there's increasing evidence that mindfulness helps to reduce certain kinds of biasing. I think that whole set of psychotechnologies, that ecology, needs to be integrated with other sets of psychotechnologies, like active open-mindedness, for example. Fantastic. John Verbecki, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this a lot.